Hi, everyone. We're happy to have the opportunity to share with you today on what we found to be essential DevOps practices for managing many AWS accounts consistently and securely, and importantly, preserving sanity in the process. My name is Ryan Tomac. I, I lead a division of engineering at Vacasa. I'm focused on software architecture, delivery of platform APIs and services, and management of cloud infrastructure. I'm joined today by Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Mann. I am a director of engineering here at Vacasa. And among other things, I focus on security, cloud infrastructure, and our data engineering platform. First, a bit about Vacasa for those that might not be familiar. We operate in the short-term rental industry. What makes us unique there is that we handle full-service property management. So in addition to marketing and booking, we also have uh, teams in each of the markets that we operate that handle maintenance, handle cleans, handle smart home device installation. This has never been done at the scale that we operate, which can only be enabled through purpose-built technology, which is Eric, where Eric and I and our teams come in. We have about 30,000 homes under management today. We host about 3 million guests per year to give you a sense of the scale that we're operating at. And we have about 200 folks in engineering and product today. The key theme for us for the last few years and for the foreseeable future is growth. So first, you might be wondering why 100 AWS accounts. Like many startups, our software stack was originally built out as a monolithic architecture. And there's nothing wrong with that. That served us really well. But we reached an inflection point a few years back where we were reaching scale challenges on two different dimensions. The first of those was system scale. We had usage and data sets that were growing. The usage patterns for those data sets were rather diverse, and we realized we needed the ability <clears throat> to scale them independently. The second is team scale. We were adding teams. We were adding lots of new features, new applications and services, those teams were, we were adding were across different geographies, and they were increasingly uh, responsible for a, a diverse set of applications and workloads. So as is common at that stage, uh, we began evolving our architecture to decompose our monolith into a set of independent services. As we made this transition, we decided on AWS accounts as our unit of isolation for each of our new services or product lines. The first reason for this was operational autonomy for our teams. With an isolated, clean AWS account, our, our teams have the latitude to provision their own infrastructure um, and direct access to that infrastructure to, to manage it and to troubleshoot issues when they arise. Second, it provides our teams architectural flexibility that they wouldn't have otherwise. Because they own and provision their own infrastructure, they can leverage, have the flexibility to leverage native AWS services that make the most sense for their workloads, rather than being locked into some lowest common denominator on centrally managed infrastructure. And thirdly, inherent in the, the isolation that this model provides are natural security boundaries between our services, which limit the blast radius of any potential compromise that we might experience in one individual service. So we like this approach, but it didn't come without some angst. This is not an attributable quote here, obviously, but, um, but pretty sure there were more than one person on the team thinking this. Um, how do we manage the complexity of this in a way that is sustainable and scales well for future growth? Eric has some of those answers, so he'll walk us through now uh, the essential DevOps practices that make this possible. Thanks, Ryan. From a central perspective, everything starts from a root account. But remember, the overall theme here is operational autonomy, but also observability. And that is why we federate multiple AWS accounts using AWS organizations. 
Each team or product line gets its own set of accounts, one each for development, staging, and production environments. These accounts express clear service boundaries and keep our overall infrastructure safe and secure. We have over 30 product lines, which means we actually have just over 100 distinct AWS accounts across our entire organization. Now, one tip for you is that before you embark on this kind of federation is to identify those service boundaries first. This way you can avoid any one application being spread across multiple accounts or environments. Managing this can be fairly straightforward if you plan ahead. We use a tool called Terraform to manage our infrastructure as code. All of our accounts are provisioned centrally with a uniform format, and every account gets the same basic format from a managed VPC to security groups, network attachments, and transit gateways, as well as IAM configuration for the different roles that are actually available within the accounts. We also use a set of very strong service control policies to define which services are allowed, which instance types within those services, which network attachments can be leveraged, and which regions into which infrastructure can be deployed. Managing the users of these different accounts is also necessary in order to maintain this level of autonomy and also observability. All of our users are provisioned into the root AWS account, but then we allow those users to assume roles within the product line account that are provisioned centrally. All of these roles are standard. They are the same in every account, but each team can define the IAM policies, the privileges that are assigned to each role within their product account. And users are given permission to assume a role in one account or another based on the groups to which those users belong when we provision the users as well. Users, just like our accounts, are provisioned via Terraform. Everything is infrastructure as code, everything is centrally managed, and everything is fully documented and auditable. We use a custom module to define user accounts. And then inside that custom module, we link to AWS modules, GitHub modules, and even VPN modules so that we can provision those users in Amazon, in GitHub with or without an admin flag, and within our VPN to determine which resources that user can actually connect to over our corporate VPN. These modules gate access to everything from GitHub to CircleCI to Jenkins Automation and the different roles, the user roles that are defined within this module, as well as the engineering teams and product lines to which a user is assigned, determine the groups that that user is going to belong to both within GitHub and within Amazon, which then determine which applications the user has access to and which IAM roles that they can assume when they're doing their day-to-day -day work. Just like our users and environments, all of our applications are provisioned with infrastructure as code as well. Every application is tied to a GitHub repository, and those GitHub repositories are terraformed by the teams maintaining them rather than centrally. This allows teams to provision new applications, new repositories, and new libraries as needed, so long as they tag their repository with the type and tier of project, the product line to which it belongs, the engineering team that is maintaining it, as well as the application lifecycle. Is this an application that's in production? Is this an application that is in progress? Or is this something that has been deprecated down the road and replaced by something else? By keeping things in infrastructure as code, there are no ad hocs, everything is consistent, and the strong tagging helps us manage the entire stack from top to bottom. All of the tags on our applications flow through both from application management down to log, event, metric, and even APM flagging in Datadog so that at a glance on any dashboard, we can identify the health of every project within our organization. Here you can see different metrics that are tagged based on a product line over time. I mentioned we use Terraform to manage our infrastructure as code, but Terraform can be pretty finicky when you move from one engineer's machine to another. So we try to abstract that workflow away from individual engineer's machines to use a network hosted tool called Atlantis. Atlantis is tied directly to our GitHub organization and will automatically run a Terraform plan on any pull request for any Terraform infrastructure as code changes that an engineering team has submitted. Once that plan has been approved, by someone else and that pull request has been approved, any engineer with write access can apply those infrastructure changes automatically on the network and make sure that everything is taken care of. This gives us a fully documented, completely auditable view of what is going on within our infrastructure, regardless of the account or product line that we can go back to and review as needed. 
And Atlantis is also a really good way for the central DevOps team to dog food our own policies because it is hosted on Kubernetes, leveraging Amazon's EKS platform as part of the operations product line that we are responsible for and maintain. Again, the theme here is autonomy, but also consistency. And the only way we can inf enforce this consistency and ensure teams have this level of autonomy is by focusing on consistent application of policy across the organization. We document all of our policies in a central resource for our engineering teams, everything from required tags to required integrations like PagerDuty for on-call and alerting, Circle CI for continuous integration and testing, Jenkins for automated deployments, and Datadog for metrics, logging, and overall observability. We also detail how to classify data and manage it securely, as well as secure coding standards and the operational level agreements that each application needs to meet as a contract with the business. We aim to meet and comply with all of these policies when we start development of any application, but we also proactively work to review our compliance on an ongoing basis to make sure that everything stays up to date and consistent as our policies do evolve over time. And when I mention policy, we sometimes talk about reviews or audits, but it's important to remember one size does not fit all. Like I said, policies do have to evolve over time, so don't be afraid to flex if the business needs it. The consistent application of policy and all of the different standard tags we have allows us to adhere to our IAC policies and make a stable, easy to inspect environment that empowers operational teams to drill down anywhere they need to within our disparate stack. All of our tags, all of our scopes, all of our environments aid in the different observability of our applications, both in terms of tracking application behavior through logs and metrics, and in terms of filtering APM traces when teams need to go in and diagnose potential flaws and have total observability into their application. Now I'll turn things over to Ryan, who will explain a bit about how these central DevOps practices and principles distill down to the team level. Thanks, Eric. With those practices in place now, our teams have the ability to provision and manage their own infrastructure, but that's no small responsibility. So we wanted to touch briefly here on how our teams are composed and what responsibilities they carry to make this work. Like many of you today, we've organized ourselves into a collection of cross-functional teams. Each of our teams have an embedded DevOps engineering role within the team. This is often a software engineer on the team that is just passionate about cloud infrastructure and DevOps practices. A tip here, one thing that's worked well for us is sponsoring AWS certifications for those DevOps, embedded DevOps engineers um, and running a coordinated guild or training program to help them prepare for that. Our central DevOps team, in addition to responsibility for the practices that are described above, also play a support role for our engineering teams. In this way, they essentially provide a community of practice around the DevOps discipline across our engineering organization. And as such, we think of them not just as a central DevOps team, but also as a DevOps enablement team. With those core practices in place, with this organizational structure in place, then our teams are really responsible for the following. Um, infrastructure as code for the uh, infrastructure provisioned for their service or application, tagging of all resources via infrastructure as code per the policy that Eric or policies that Eric described above, running a Datadog agent within the AWS account that their service runs in, and then building out operational dashboards within Datadog and configuring on-call rotations within PagerDuty. So as we look ahead, we're not finished. There are areas here we believe we can improve. First, increased usage of infrastructure as code for definition of Datadog monitors and dashboards. As you can see, we're doing some of this today, but we'd like to make this practice pervasive so we can achieve the same level of version history and repeatability that we enjoy with all of our cloud infrastructure. To enable that, uh, we see an opportunity here for central DevOps to provide 
Terraform modules so that teams can uniformly compose those monitors and dashboards quickly for their services. There's also an opportunity here we see for our central DevOps team to provide managed Datadog agents into each of these service accounts, which would work at least for certain types of workloads so that our teams don't just don't need to worry about that. Thank you for joining us. We, we hope you found some of the ideas here useful or at least interesting. Uh, we would be very happy to follow up with uh, any questions that you might have. So feel free to get in touch with Eric or I.